Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Polliger, and I'm here for the Authors at Google program. And we're here to welcome uh, Jonathan Bender. Uh, he's the author of Lego, A Love Story, which was released just this past May. Uh, it covers the year that Jonathan spent immersed in the adult fans of Lego community, traveling to conventions in search of the world's largest private Lego collection. His journey also took him abroad to Billund, I think is the correct pronunciation, in Denmark, which is Lego headquarters, where he uh, was able to take a factory tour and also see the secret set vault, which I'm sure none of us have been able to see. It's on the web? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Ruin all the surprises. Uh, while I was attempting to understand why adults are so drawn to uh, a child's toy, he and his wife were starting a family of their own. Uh, originally a journalistic documentary third party, or sorry, third person project, he quickly felt himself drawn into the world of adult fans and uh, attempted to build alongside them. And nobody can really resist the draw of a pile of Lego bricks just waiting to be built. He's a freelance journalist. His writing has appeared on CNN, ESPN, Women's Health, and the Kansas City Star, amongst others. He makes his home in Kansas City with his wife and has significantly more, he tells me, than the 62 Lego bricks that exist for every man, woman, and child on Earth. And with that, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Bender. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Um, so what I wanted to do very quickly uh, was introduce myself, uh, talk to you about some of the things that I, I learned and saw over the course of the book. Uh, and then Mark was very nice to forward on to me uh, three or four questions that, that people had had in advance. Uh, so I'll answer those after I give my talk. And then feel free to open it up to questions. Uh, if some of you feel shy, I'm also going to stick around and, and sign books afterwards. And you can ask me questions then. Um, but I think this is going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I always really enjoy talking about Lego bricks. And to some degree, the past 24 hours, I think, have been a bit of a, a dream experience. Because at this time yesterday, I was actually on a, a panel at Comic-Con uh, talking about adult fans of Lego. Uh, so coming to Comic-Con and then Google here in Mountain View, I think that's sort of like a, a geek's perfect game. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of nailing it right now. So uh, that feels pretty good. Uh, so thanks for having me here. And uh, I, I really I look forward to kind of sharing with you um, what I learned. So I want you to picture, if you can, uh, basically a world that's like today. Uh, the economy is pretty terrible. And uh, obviously, people are having trouble selling their homes. Now, in particular, there's a carpenter. Uh, he's a master carpenter in Denmark. And he's built three homes. He owns the largest home in the small town of Billund. And uh, he's in danger of losing that home because he can't sell uh, any of those three homes because the economy has, has gone through the Great Depression. Uh, so it's a, a very difficult time to be in the world of carpentry. Uh, and that man is actually in the center of your slide screen there. Uh, looks a little bit like Walt Disney. Uh, it's Ole Kirk Christensen is uh, the man's name. And Ole Kirk Christensen is uh, the founder of Lego. And so in 1932, uh, he does a very, very smart thing. He realizes that people will not buy wooden houses, but they will always buy things for their children. And so Lego actually began as a wooden toy company. Uh, most people think of the classic plastic bricks, but it started with wood. Uh, and they made trains and tractors and wooden ducks and uh, sort of very classic, simple wooden toys. Uh, now, the issue with making wooden toys is uh, wood is extremely flammable. And uh, there were actually four separate fires at uh, the factory where they made wooden toys. And so I, I think uh, Old Kirk Christensen realized pretty quickly uh, that it's a bit of a mistake to work just in wood. And then as the company itself became more popular, he realized that he should probably be using something that could be mass manufactured. And plastic came to mind. Uh, so Lego is actually two Danish words put together, leg and goat, uh, which stands for play well. Uh, that's the loose translation in English. And actually, at the time, uh, Christensen didn't know, but there's a third translation in Latin, uh, which means I put together. So actually, in three languages, Lego means the same thing, uh, which is it's kind of neat. Um, and so in 1958, uh, this is actually the original patent for the Lego brick. On top, you can see are the tubes, which are those little holes on bottom. And uh, the bottom figure is actually for the studs, which are what click into the tubes and allow Lego bricks to stick together. And what's pretty amazing about this is this first patent that's from 1958 is actually the same Lego brick we have today. Uh, so there's not a lot of products that I feel like have stayed similar for so long. Uh, but this one is, is one that is endured. Uh, so Lego still makes 
a lot of very different products. Uh, you know, they're starting to move into electronics and robotics, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, but for now, uh, they've really relied on having things as an offshoot of this classic two by four, you know, plastic blocky brick. Uh, so the one you think of when you first think of Lego is, is really the one that they started with. And so in 1961, uh, Lego was looking at coming to the United States. And when you're thinking about who would be a natural partner uh, for Lego in the US, uh, obviously your first thought is Samsonite, the luggage maker. Um, they had experience in both plastics as well as uh, retail sales. And so Lego signed on to allow them to sell their company's products in the US. Uh, not surprisingly, Samsonite didn't do a particularly good job of marketing Lego bricks to children. Uh, because I, I don't know how much crossover there is between luggage uh, purchasers and toy purchasers. And so in 1973, Lego took back uh, their franchise and began licensing and marketing Lego in the United States themselves. And that's the beginning of when Lego really started to take off. Uh, but the true year that Lego really started to seize the US market was 1978. Uh, and that's because that's the year I was born. And uh, so beyond me being born, uh, Lego also made a couple really important distinctions in 78. They introduced uh, the Lego minifigure, which you see here. Although the first one had none of these facial features or even arms, uh, he was a really simple uh, guy. And so that was part of it, that there was this element of play to Lego that had never been there before. And then in addition, they also introduced themes. So this is the classic space theme. There was also castle and town. Um, so what's great is some of these initial themes. This is called the Yellow Castle. Uh, it's the first Lego set uh, that was introduced in 78 uh, as a play theme in the United States. And so if you run across one of these at a garage sale or on eBay, uh, you should buy it because it's, it's the kind of thing that could fund your kid's college tuition in a couple of years. Uh, right now, this set probably goes for about $1,500 or $2,000 in mint condition, uh, which, if you think about a Lego set in the store, is, is pretty incredible. Um, it's part a mix, I think, of sentimental value and then also uh, actual rarity. So the, the nature of Lego bricks is that they all get jumbled up. So the idea that somebody would not only keep the original box and uh, also all the pieces together, that concept of collecting wasn't as developed in 78. And so I think things, uh, things like this just you don't see very often. So when I was 12, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be, I would have said a, a master model builder. Uh, they're the guys who work for Lego at theme parks and then also uh, just for the company in general, building big, giant models of, of just about everything you can imagine. Um, and so this is a picture of, of me and my dad. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm much older than 12 in that picture. Um, this occurred after uh, I would started to get back into researching the book. Uh, what's in that diorama box, uh, which is on your left, um, or right, you're right, my left, and uh, is the Sears Tower that I built uh, with my dad in fourth grade. And that's part of the genesis for how the book came about, was uh, Lego was a big part of my childhood. Um, but when I turned 12, I, I gave Lego up. Uh, I found soccer and piano and all manner of other things that you get into uh, when you're starting to grow up a bit. Uh, so those bricks went into the closet. Um, but what was great is when I got back into it at 30, as I started to do some research for the book, Lego has a series of sets that are called brick structures or Lego architecture, uh, which are actual recreations of landmarks, in this case, the Sears Tower. So Lego set uh, and my set are, are both pictured there. And I, I had the rare opportunity to go back and build the Sears Tower again with my dad uh, 18 years later. And uh, I feel like it, it was just a wonderful experience for the two of us, uh, because here we were building as adults, uh, but it was a bit like when he had built me when I was a kid. Um, and so one of the things that really grabbed me when I first started uh, thinking about the book was this, which is a, a Lego 22-foot Titanic. Uh, it's built entirely of Lego bricks. It comes apart in three seven-foot sections, and it's built by an adult fan named Scott Fowler. And it sort of triggered something in me, the what, where, when, why, that are sort of hardwired into journalists. And I, I wanted to know why somebody could build this, how they would go about building it, and then you know, who would want to. And what was great about that is there's a, a period of time called the Dark Ages, uh, which is what adult fans refer to when you give up Lego bricks. 
So when you turn 12 or 13 or 14, you go into the Dark Ages, and then something pulls you out of it. And uh, for those rare fans who continue to play, some might have dim ages, you know, where they, they make compromises and they continue to play with Lego bricks. Others uh, will just play straight on through. And it's actually a phenomenon that Lego recognizes now. So the, the company thinks of kid builders or child up to age 13. And so up to 13, you're safe, and you're probably going to keep building. And then 13, for whatever reason, is the magical age when you put it down and go into the dark ages. So if you've made it past 13 and you still play with Lego bricks, uh, you're considered an adult builder by Lego. And I'm, I'm jealous of you, because uh, it was about 18 years that I didn't have uh, you know, playing with Lego bricks in my life. So I, I feel like I'm making up for lost time. And so. When I went back to a series of conventions around the country, uh, adult fans hold conventions like Trekkies or comic book collectors like Comic-Con. You know, they're on a, a much smaller scale. And this is actually the first thing I built uh, since I got back into LEGO. Uh, appropriately, it's built with LEGO Duplo bricks, uh, which are meant for preschoolers. Like, you start at about age one and a half. Uh, so it was right about my building skill level at the time in 2008. And I, I think this is a great picture, because I feel like it illustrates uh, where I was then and, and where I'm still about now. In the foreground, you'll see uh, what I termed a crocodile or alligator. I, I like to think that it is recognizable as such. But in the 20 minutes that it took me to build that you know, seven or eight piece figure, uh, one of the adult fans who was at that convention in Michigan built a Tyrannosaurus Rex out of Duplo bricks. Uh, and he wasn't bragging, he was just much better. And uh, so to me, it was illustrative of I, I sort of saw that I had a long way to go because it, at 30, it's very different to think about becoming a master model builder than it is at 12. So one of the great things is as adults, I think we bring a lot of our fan interests and then also our experiences to what we build. And so there are two huge camps among adult fans of LEGO. Uh, they're the customizers. And so these are guys who build things like the Iron Man that you see behind me, which is great. It's a standard minifig. So if you took that castle minifig I showed you earlier, you would use brasso or something abrasive on the chest to rub off any figures. And then you would drill a hole through the arm to insert a small aftermarket LED in the chest, hands, and then feet. And uh, to me, it's almost like requiring uh, you know, surgery or some incredibly uh, complex skill in order to turn a, a tiny minifigure into a tiny Iron Man. Um, but the idea here is that some people feel limited by what LEGO produces. So they say that there's only a certain number of parts and colors and elements, and I'm not satisfied with that. And I want an Iron Man, so I'm going to go build it. But what I love is there are people who are purists. And so for them, the idea of cutting into a minifigure and putting lights in it is sacrilege. You know, the idea that my dad and I painted and glued the Sears Tower would uh, make them shun me. And, uh, and so what, what's neat about the purists, just to show you for contrast, is that this is a piece that's built entirely out of Lego elements. Uh, there's a builder named Jordan Schwartz. He's an 18-year-old high school kid uh, who just graduated in Rhode Island. This is built primarily out of Lego tires, uh, most of which are inverted. So the two eyes and then the bell or base of that octopus. But he built uh, an octopus, which I think is akin to sculpture. Uh, when I've shown it in previous slideshows, people have thought it was made of clay or something that wasn't just Lego elements. But everything you see in there is from an actual Lego set. Um, so the nice thing is, I think, depending on who you're talking to, whether it's a purist or customizer, it's very easy to be swayed by their argument because of what they can create. So now, a lot of things that happen at uh, conventions, uh, so for example, the next one coming up is Brick Fair, which is in Washington, D.C., are group displays. Uh, adult fans tend to congregate by region or get together online into what are called LUGs, so LEGO user groups. Uh, and the great thing is, out of those LUGs and then also at conventions, there are these huge group displays. This one is from a, a convention in Seattle called Brick Con, and it's actually the Zombie Apocafest. So it's, it's displaying a, a theoretical zombie attack on a, a blown out city. Uh, if you can see a yellow school bus in the back, uh, that is the best thing in the display, and it's because I built it. Uh, so what's fun about that is uh, the idea is everybody builds on the same scale and brings pieces. So you'd bring a building or a vehicle or even just used your minifig customization ability to build zombie minifigs. Uh, which up until this summer with the minifig collectibles, Lego had never made a zombie. Uh, so it was up to you to either use your creativity and repurpose troll pieces or to actually sit down and, and build one, you know, out of clay and paint and who knows what. 
Um, but what I, I like about conventions too is that you can also have individuals who have collections large enough to make displays as large as any group display. Uh, so this is a builder named Brian Darrow out of Indianapolis who has a 33-foot display uh, called the Blacktron Intelligence Agency. It's based on a black and yellow space theme uh, from the 70s and 80s. And for him, this is uh, it's great because he, he literally sets it up over the course of about 14 hours. And this is all just one guy's imagination kind of run amok. You know, he has a collection of a couple hundred thousand bricks, a, a lot of which go into his display. Uh, and it's just as magnificent as that group display that you saw. Um, but you don't have to be constrained by how many bricks you have. So you can build very small and still have a, a pretty large impact. And when I was talking earlier about different fandoms, uh, the Harry Potter sets went into hibernation uh, for a few years based on licensing and movies. And so they're coming out with new sets in October. And LEGO just released the Harry Potter uh, video game sort of based on like the Star Wars, Indiana Jones, blocky theme. Um, but this was at a convention in um, North Carolina this year. It's a, a vignette of a Quidditch match. And so the uh, players appear to be flying. They're on brooms. And uh, Lego did make Harry Potter figurines, but they obviously didn't make a, a Quidditch sort of vignette or style or setup. And so here's someone who just wanted to use what they saw as uh, inspiration. And in this case, it happened to be Harry Potter. They built the Whomping Willow and the inside of Hogwarts with flying letters. But I thought it's sort of a wonderful example of, I, I mean, this looks like it could be a set. Uh, and it's actually only on one green base plate, uh, which you guys have upstairs in the little uh, Lego dump room. Uh, so you can go ahead and, and build it yourself, assuming you have all the parts. Now, one of the things I was looking for was uh, the largest collection in the U.S. And, and probably one of the best contenders is a guy named Dan Brown, who lives in Bel Air, Ohio. And he has the unofficial uh, toy and plastic brick museum. And what's great about that is he is a computer recycler by trade who decided the thing he wanted to do with his life was honor Lego art and sculptures. So he bought not one, but two middle schools at auction in 2004. One to store his Lego collection, and one to build a museum. And, and what I love about Dan is the one that holds his collection has about two million bricks, uh, which the average set has between uh, 100 and uh, 1, 1,500 bricks. So, it, I mean, it's a lot of sets for him to accumulate that many bricks. And then the second setup is a middle school that is slowly being transformed into a museum, classroom by classroom. And so each one has a theme or a setup. This particular theme is from the zoo room. And so it's a Winnie the Pooh that's behind homemade chicken wire. And the great thing is it's really like walking into a middle school that is essentially the structural equivalent of that Sears Tower diorama that I built. This is all ideas that come from Dam's mind, and then he translate into building out his museum. Uh, and so you're walking around a place that really, I think, takes you into somebody else's mind or what they really love about Lego art. So, for example, in the basement, he has a robotic band called Plastica that used to play at FAO Schwartz in New York City that I remember from when I was 12. Now, he told me it was $60,000 worth of robotics. And so on a Sunday night in the middle of summer, I'm sitting there listening to this robotic band play Lego music uh, in a middle school gymnasium in front of what's now the, the world's, uh, world, like Guinness Book of World Records for the largest mosaic in the world, uh, which Dan holds. And it's, it's a tiny town of 5,000 on the border of West Virginia. And uh, it's the kind of thing that I feel like nobody knows about, but in many respects is an actual manifestation of just how excited people build. And, and Dan is on the cusp. This is the first generation of adult fans. And so for him, he really wants to preserve Lego art. And one of the people who he wants to preserve is a guy named Nathan Sawaya. And Nathan designed the cover of my book. Uh, and he's a guy who has commissions where all he does, he was a, a corporate lawyer who left his job to build uh, Lego commissions. This is actually a 10-foot a speedboat uh, that has a working rudder and tan bucket, you know, racecraft seats um, that I help move. It's uh, about 250,000 Lego bricks, and it weighs several hundred pounds. And uh, for about 30 minutes, it was on a, a four-foot wooden dock as we, we carried it, you know, over the Pacific Ocean out into the parking lot, because uh, this was at a convention in Seattle. So what was really exciting about that was uh, if it had dropped off the dock, it would have sunk immediately. Uh, and so Dan paid $5,000 uh, for this model. And it, it's sort of the what's going to happen next with Lego art. You know, trying to figure out what it's worth, not only in terms of the actual value of the bricks themselves, but then for creating an art piece, 
out of a medium, you know, potentially anybody could build this boat. But as to whether they have the skill, time, and bricks to do it is the question. So, you know, what price do you put on Lego art? And then can Lego be art? I feel like are some of the things that are being debated now. And so now Nathan is an interesting guy in the sense that he worked as a master model builder at Lego. He had my dream job. And then he left to go out on his own. He's one of 14 certified Lego professionals. Um, so they build commission jobs, and uh, I mean, they really have a, a dream job from that perspective. Uh, but one guy who is in his old position is named Gary McIntyre. And Gary's actually at Legoland in San Diego, just down the road. And Gary gave me a, a tour uh, of the park before it opened, and he does something called park check every morning. So the idea is that he has to fix all of the Lego models, which get beaten up over the course of the day, just to make sure nobody gets hurt. Um, and what I love about this is uh, here Gary is is fixing what they call a maxi fig. It's a, she's about three feet tall. It's just a scaled up version of a mini fig uh, model that's built entirely out of Lego bricks. Now, unfortunately for her, uh, her nose was knocked off because she, uh, she has the sad distinction of being located next to the only miniature golf course in Legoland. And so invariably, her nose lasts about two to three days um, because somebody decides to take a, a mini golf club to her nose. Um, but the nice thing is she was not harmed, and uh, since she's made out of Lego, she can be rebuilt in seconds. Um, and so Gary is actually an adult fan of Lego, as is uh, Nathan and uh, a lot of the people that I met over the course of this book who are working with Lego or attempting to figure out how they can turn their passion for Lego into a, a full-time job. And so this is one of the things that Gary built, which got a, a lot of press recently. It's uh, the inauguration for President Obama. And uh, so these are mini land scale figurines. Uh, everything in here is, is built to scale. So all of these guys would translate to about six foot people. Uh, if you're holding them in your hand, they're you know, three, three and a half inches tall, depending on what they are. Uh, but it's a great visual depiction of uh, different sizes and scales. There's mini land, which is at the Legoland park itself. And there's mini land Las Vegas and mini land New York. So actual creations of real places. There's minifig scale, which is where you build something four or six studs wide in order to be a, a, attached to a, a minifig driver or just a house that would fit a minifig person. And then there's maxi fig or just sort of big, big ass building, um, which doesn't have a name. So, but we'll go with big ass building from now on. Um, so then another way that adult fans are working with Lego, uh, some of you may have seen this. Uh, one of the first brick structure sets was that Sears Tower that I mentioned. This is actually Falling Water. Uh, so it's an official Lego set that is the uh, uh, same as Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, iconic building. And uh, what I love about this is it, it changes your perception of Lego a bit in the sense that this is something that's meant to be built and displayed. Uh, you're probably not going to take it apart. Um, and to some degree, it's become a bit of a, a niche hit uh, with architects uh, and designers uh, because there are genuine design elements at work here. And it's also a, a bit of something that's easy to fetishize. I think you can look at it and sort of have a, a great appreciation. And so it's built by Adam Reed Tucker, uh, who's a former architect out of Chicago. And now this is his sole business where he builds what are called brick structures. The latest one is the White House uh, that just came out last month. Um, and it's some of the examples of how Lego is working with adult fans in order to try and figure out ways to leverage either their building skills or their interests and, and see, you know, is there a way for them to have a partnership. Um, now, I've shown you a lot of examples of things that people do very well, um, but I think it's important, it's easy to be intimidated when you see great things. Uh, and so this is something that I've built. And uh, I, I think it's important that it's fairly recognizable. The yellow thing is a, is a whale, and uh, the white, yellow, and red thing is a camel. Um, you probably could guess one of the two of those by looking at that. Um, but I, I show this for one very particular reason, because I, I think it's important. And the adult fan community is extraordinarily welcoming. And to them, it's a, a bit like Little League, where participation matters more than skill. And so I, I think my sort of ending note, or, or the thing I want to suggest to you, is that uh, you don't have to build well as an adult in order to be a part of this community. You just have to build. So find the thing that you like doing, or you know, whether it's Harry Potter or something else like whales, and, uh, and give it a shot. Because uh, I think it's very easy to be self-critical as an adult. 30-year-old uh, me is very different than 12-year-old me, because I sit and look at what I build, and uh, I judge it the entire time. So I, I think you have to try and put that aside. And Mark had mentioned to me that there's a, a nice thing here, the ugly baby syndrome. 
you know, where uh, you, you can hold on to something because you, you really don't want to show it. Um, and then when you do, you get worried about that criticism. But uh, you'll find, I think, that most people are willing to tell you how to improve something as opposed to focusing on the, uh, the shortcomings. So I, I encourage you all to build. I've had a, a wonderful experience since coming out of my dark ages. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd just like to turn it over to the, the few questions that you guys asked in advance and then open it right up to the rest of the panel. Um, I'll read them first just so you have an idea of what people asked and then hopefully answer them. If whoever asked them is here and feels like I didn't cover it properly, uh, call me to task and I'll, I'll see what I can do. So the, the first question that somebody asked was uh, if I had any experience with Mindstorms and first LEGO League. Um, and so the, the honest answer with that is very, very little. Uh, when I was researching the, the book, I went to one first LEGO League meeting, and uh, it taught me that, that I would have to, I think, go to about 50 to understand exactly what first LEGO League entails and to become proficient about it. Um, so I, I ended my first LEGO League participation at that one meeting. Um, but one of the interesting things about Mindstorms to me, which is, is LEGO Robotics, for those of you who don't know, is that adult fans have had a big role in shaping how Mindstorms have come to play. So the first version of Mindstorm's robotics invention systems debuted in 1998, and it was wildly successful for LEGO. It's one of the reasons the company is as successful as it is today and then has managed to transition to a digital space, because it showed that LEGO is capable of applying its principles to the world we live in today. Uh, and then in the same light, it tapped into this need for math and science education. And so as LEGO looked at the sales numbers for those first you know, million units that they sold, they discovered something incredible. Uh, the adult fan market is typically 5% of the total of people buying Lego. So only 5% of, of people are actually adults who buy Lego bricks. But for the robotics uh, invention systems, for this Mindstorm stuff, it was 50%. They, they dubbed these adults the shadow market um, because there were as many adults buying robotics kits as kids. Um, and so they reached out to some of the more proficient and or visible adults, uh, sort of Ocean's Eleven style. So the idea was they wanted to get somebody who knew software and somebody who knew hardware. And they flew four guys out to form the initial Mindstorm users panel. And those four guys really helped guide some of the development for the second iteration, uh, which is Mindstorm's NXT that came out in 2006. And so what's great about that, it was the first example of LEGO really reaching out to adult fans in order to develop a product both internally and externally. So a lot of those guys still act as ambassadors for the product and are in stores teaching people how to use it. Um, and then in the same light, shepherded the change from studded to studless building. Uh, so it's very different. In the Mindstorms NXT, there's no studs. It's all technic, uh, which are pins and holes. And if we're getting too technical here, uh, please let me know. But you went away from that studs and tube system that I showed you earlier, that patent. And uh, so it, it represents really a whole new system of LEGO building, even if it's founded on the same LEGO principles. So the second question that was asked, uh, talked about, so it said, do you keep original sets apart or mix them? And if you mix, do you sort first by color or shape? And which is the one true religion? Um, so uh, the answer is, I think among uh, adult fans of LEGO, the one true religion has something to do with like Metachlorians and or Jedis. Uh, there's a lot of Star Wars geeks. Uh, that was my joke. And so the the real joy of that is that I think you try and keep things separate, but you never can. Uh, because Lego bricks end up in a big Sterilite or Tupperware tub, and they're under your bed or they're in the closet. There's sort of no way to keep sets separate, uh, unless I think a lot of adult fans just adopt a strategy of buying multiples, and they are emphatic and or sort of militaristic about separating it out. So this is my, my set that I'm going to put together, and this is my set that I'm never going to open, and this is my set that I'm going to part out. And so uh, before you know it, you're buying four and five copies of a set, which at 30 to to $100, yeah, can be delightfully expensive. Um, but in, in many ways, is possibly the only way that you can keep everything separate, uh, is to sort of be a bit, uh, I guess, maniacal or maniacal about what you're doing. Um, but other than that, I think you just have to embrace the idea that things are going to get mixed. Uh, and then that's which leads to the third question, which is about sorting. Um, and so the, the sorting question I enjoyed because it talks about uh, if you, uh, you sort by color or shape. And so you start with color. Uh, that's the easiest for everybody. Uh, it's the most distinct. Uh, you know, yellow goes in one bin, blue goes in another. And then there comes a point where you can't find anything to build what you want. So then you move on to shape. And you sort by part or element piece. 
Uh, so there's a lot of different names. And, and one of the things that was most daunting when I was researching the book was about the language of adult fans. You know, the names for specific bricks are multivaried and confusing and change from region and country. And so, uh, for example, there are the flat ones, which some might call flats. Uh, other people call plates. That's their actual name. And then there's bricks and slopes, which is anything that has a, an actual slope on it. Um, so when you start sorting by piece or element, then you break it out according to that. Um, so now you had two iterations of sorting, one by color, one by piece, and you've gotten to the same place where you just can't find anything while you're building, and you're spending as much time rifling your hands through a, a tub as you are actually building. So now you move to what you would consider to be like the real advanced stage, which is sorting by part and color, and that's really, you're, you're starting to be a pro. Uh, because you are buying specific things at hardware shops or hobby lobbies and they look like uh, the nuts and bolts containers that are segregated so they're plastic and you just keep having smaller and smaller groupings of parts because you need to keep things more specific. I, uh, your house begins to look like a garage and by this point your collection has overgrown one room and is threatening to take over your entire house. It's a, a bit like the blob. And then the problem is now you think you're done but you're going to come to a point where, once again, you can't find anything. So that shouldn't be possible, but it is, because you keep buying Lego bricks. Uh, it's sort of an addiction, or, uh, I, you know, it just Lego bricks attach or attract each other like magnets. And, uh, you know, once you have a, a little bit, you tend to have a lot. And so that final sorting phase is where you actually are sorting by individual piece. It's not enough to just do shape and color. It's like every piece gets their own tiny uh, compartment. And when you've reached that point, you're basically a master model builder. Uh, so, so congrats. You know, I mean, that part is there is an element that your building skill ideally will improve with sorting. Um, and then the last question that was here was uh, about the design program. And it said, is there a, a particular design program that I'd recommend for building things and then specifically vehicles? So you basically have two options, uh, both of which are 3D modeling or CAD-based programs. Uh, the first is actually Lego's own program. It's, uh, it's called Lego uh, Digital Designer. It's LDD, and that's on Lego's website. They have a program that's factory and designed by me. So the idea is you can use any parts that are on their site to design your own set or kit or creation, um, and then you'll get customized building instructions, and they'll mail you all the pieces, and you are basically your own set designer. Um, what's neat about that is it, it lets you be as creative as you want and gives you the opportunity to see some 3D modeling tricks or techniques and work with that. I think that's where you should start, uh, but I don't think that's where you should finish. The, the best one you can use is called LDRAW. It's just at LDRAW.org, and it has a, a larger element and color palette. So the beauty of that is you're not constrained by what LEGO sells on their website, but instead you can use any of the parts that are in LEGO's uh, universe. So the idea is similar to how you would add something to Google Maps. Uh, I saw the 3D version of the Google Map, and somebody can render a picture of the pavilion. Uh, people can render individual parts and add them to LDRAW. So suddenly you're working with a really rich composition of things, and you end up with a, a 3D mock-up of what it is that you want to build that has the same capability as Lego's website. So you can have custom instructions if you wanted to give it to somebody else, and you can also break it out by what parts you've used, uh, which is really helpful for ordering. So there's a, a secondary marketplace called bricklink.com, and that works exactly like eBay. So if you found that you needed 50 white pieces, uh, rather than having to buy 50 sets, uh, you can just go to Bricklink and order those specific parts, so that way you can build your Ecto-1. Um, and at this point, you guys have been exhausted of your pre-questions. I hope I've inspired some new ones. Are there... I have a funny story. A friend of mine from grad school went to work, I guess as a consultant, to build a uh, Lego company to work on vision algorithms for identifying Lego pieces for sorting them out so they could like straighten out the mess the builders had made at the end of the day. Failed totally. <laughs> um, I'll be in back, and I'm glad to talk to any of you more, but thank you guys for your time today. <laughs>